Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and we are discussing today integrated multi-sectoral approaches to addressing the critical agricultural and food security challenges that affect the Global South with our special guests, Kate Chester, uh, PhD, President and CEO of World Neighbors, Bridget Carrington, Interim CEO of, Co- of the Coffee Quality Institute, and Maria Kasparian, Executive Director of Odessa Nutrition. I might have messed up the name, Odessa? Odessa Nutrition. Yeah, you got it. So thank you all for joining us. I am so excited about talking about food, one of my favorite topics. Uh, Countries in the Global South will not achieve prosperity until these regions are able to sustainably feed their people and not depend, depend on imports of food. It's a really important point. And so to shift... To shift realities, you really do have to st- have to start with fundamentals like food, access to water, health, sanitation, and so on. So uh, we're going to go around the table and just give a quick summary of what each of you do and how each of you views these problems. So starting with uh, uh, Kate at World Neighbors, could you share your perspective on this incredibly complicated set of challenges as we seek sustainability in the global south when it comes to food production? Kate? Thank you, Mark, and thanks for having me on the show. World Neighbors is a relatively old organization. We've been around for uh, almost 72 years uh, this April, and we work primarily or actually exclusively with very remote communities, uh, rural agricultural communities in 14 countries around the world. Of course, this is the main focus of our work is food security. Um, in order in order to really help these communities, we have a methodology that is primarily focused on training, but also on self-sufficiency. So we have a community-based methodology, which is teaching people basically to help themselves. And uh one of the, the the main things that we do is teach the farmers to have food to grow their own food. So, in addition to maybe growing cash crops um, or having uh, fish ponds or other sorts of uh, revenue sources, we every single community that we go into, we teach people to have their own kitchen gardens. Don't buy your vegetables; grow your vegetables. Uh, we uh, grow. We promote growing local, resilient crops. Looking at um, crops that may have sort of disappeared, but are we're now trying to bring them back. Uh, that goes for seeds as well. Uh, sharing seeds that might be more resilient to uh, climate change. We we promote conservation agriculture, which means minimum soil tillage, a uh, permanent soil coverage. Uh, crop diversification, rotation of crops, intercropping, um, and all of these things help during uh, very difficult periods of drought. They produce, they, they increase productivity of, of the soil. Again, another very you know essential component is water management, uh, cisterns, uh, rainwater, uh, conservation, use, usage of gray water, using solar pumps to irrigate large fields. We promote biosan water filters in all the households that we work with. Um, and now we're really pushing this idea of water sourced, uh, water based farming. So getting farmers to try to work near their water sources instead of bringing the water to the, the fields. You know, um, this, the thing that re- that really strikes me is that in this country, we have a very sophisticated Department of Agriculture that does this exact same thing for American farmers. So you are basically, and uh, you're also repairing some of the destructive practices that occurred over 60 or 70 years of Green Revolution, um, well-intentioned uh, policies that basically encourage people to buy seeds from a central source, to go to monocultures, to uh, focus on sort of this industrial um, distribution, not to grow their own vegetables and so on. Bridget, when when you look at the Coffee Institute, you're taking a cut of what um, Kate is talking about, but you're focusing on, on specifically on coffee. Uh, Talk about how you see this problem set from your perspective at the Coffee Quality Institute. 
Uh, you want to you want to uh, un- unmute your microphone. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> fell at the first hurdle there. Uh, thanks and thanks for for having me. Also, yeah, actually, what Kate's just said resonates a lot with 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 a lot of the work that we see as part of our our projects. And CQI Coffee Quality Institute uh, is is twenty five years old and has been providing education. Um, it's an educational trust, and we provide education uh, in um, quality coffee quality both sensory, so how you taste coffee and how you understand its value through taste and also through post-harvest processing. So how that affects the quality of the coffee and ultimately the value of the coffee. So basically our aim is through education uh, to provide, uh, emp- empower farmers and create sustainable livelihoods and sustainable coffee communities, sustainable agriculture. And what we try to do is, or what we've tried to do through our program, our educational program, is create a, a common language that is runs through the whole value chain. And so the buyers and the sellers can talk the same language and the farmers can understand more about the value of their product. They can then have better access to market and better market linkage. And hopefully they can you know, sell it for a higher price because farmers, I mean, more than half of smallholder farmers live below the poverty line. They don't produce enough coffee to create themselves a livelihood. So they uh, basically it's a vicious circle. They can't if they don't have food, they, they can't afford food. They can't afford to feed their trees. So they get less crop. And so they, they, they live in this below this, this this poverty line. And also coffee is a long term crop. It, it's, it's not a co- uh, it's a cash crop, but it's not or in many countries. It's a cash crop where I am in Kenya at the moment. It's not even a cash crop. So they may have to wait a year, more than a year to get the revenue from the coffee that they has been on the trees and it's being sold um, right it's a, it's a it's a process to go from from being to actually a, a, a product absolutely so i mean to... a, the harvest is like the the crop cycle is about nine months nine ten months right. so they have to wait a long time so when we're doing projects and we work on a lot of donor projects providing the educational part of that and the training part of that but um, that's also, you know, to teach them how to diversify, to teach them how to intercrop, to create, I don't know, dairy farming, to grow mangoes, to grow avocados, to create different um, revenue streams so that, you know, that they can afford to send the children to school all through the year and they can afford to the medicines they need or the home improvements they really need to try and improve their livelihoods. But basically in coffee, the problem is um, that... Obviously, it's linked to the international futures market. So sometimes the far, the price is below, way below the cost of production. And that ultimately is the problem in coffee, that we need to pay farmers more than the cost of production in order for them to have sustainable livelihoods from coffee. The thing that really strikes me is this transfer of knowledge and the transfer of power and the whole idea of creating rationality that actually benefits the entire system. Maria, um, could you unmic- uh, unmute your mic? Because it's time for us to hear about Adesia. And Adesia has just a very, very fascinating business model. Talk a little bit about uh, how Adesia Nutrition sees this problem set and the programs that you promote. Sure. So we're talking a lot about food, and food is in a, inextricably linked from nutrition. Right. So it's not just about full bellies. It's also about the right nutrition, macronutrients, micronutrients. So enough fat, enough protein, enough vitamins and minerals to grow healthy bodies and brains. And Edesia's mission is to help treat and prevent malnutrition all over the world um, and especially in vulnerable populations. So vulnerable populations, zero to or conception to two years of age. We talk a lot about the first thousand days of life. So very young children and pregnant and lactating moms being some of the most important groups to reach to make sure that the right building blocks are there for healthy bodies and brains and ultimately healthier lives. So we manufacture, we're a little further along the supply chain. We manufacture ready to use therapeutic foods. This is called plumpy nut. And that is to treat kids that are already severely malnourished. We are unfortunately doing a lot of that right now. We work with partners like UNICEF, the World Food Program, USAID, NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, Save the Children, um, because of COVID, climate change, um, and all sorts of crisis and conflict, we're seeing very high rates and food prices. I think we, we heard that mentioned as well. Food prices are up. That means people don't have enough access to diverse diets. 
that means we're seeing more malnutrition. So we are manufacturing these foods in the United States and distributing them through the partners I mentioned. In addition to that, we're also working, we're part of a network called the Plumpy Field Network. Um, so we have partner factories in Ethiopia, Niger, Sudan, Nigeria, India, Haiti. There are nine total in developing countries where they're also manufacturing these products, um, not only the plumpy nut, but also products that are more geared toward prevention and supplementing to make sure the macro and micronutrients are there. So those factories in the field also work along the supply chains in their regions to help make sure that they can source more of the ingredients they need to make the product. So that means sourcing peanuts, means working with peanut farmers, sourcing soy, working with soy farmers, oils, milk products, sugar, vitamins and minerals um, along the supply chain. So it's, it's kind of both meeting the immediate emergency and then building more sustainable um, systems and, and um, supply chains so that the needs can be met locally. It strikes me that the commonality between all of the three organizations that are represented here and, and so much of the thinking that is going on right now is this idea of, of global and local simultaneously. And that um, the solution seems to reside more and more and more, or the consciousness that the solution resides more and more and more in the global South itself uh, with the farmers Kate, you're you're nodding uh, along. Uh, talk a little bit about that because you you you've been in this field for a long time, right? You've seen the changes. When you first came, that really wasn't the idea, right? I mean, 20, 30 years ago, it was sort of those poor people kind of kind of thing. And I think that the the ideas have changed to a more listening, more attentive. You know, instead of thinking about those poor people. Instead, thinking maybe that those people actually always had the solution and we kind of screwed it up and maybe we should be talking to each other. Kate, how do you see the, the, the changes? Well, it's interesting that you, you your first reaction when I was talking about all the ways in which we're trying to create food security and improve uh, sustainable agriculture was to go to the American model and say, oh, well, we have all this and, you know, and our, our agriculture department helps our farmers. And I think that what, what came to mind immediately is how important it is to respect local expertise. So one of the things that we do is we don't use external consultants or even um, many times we try to get people who are from that particular region to be the, the experts and to be the trainers. So for example, in the Andes, in Peru, you want somebody who's dealt with the challenges of working in these very remote, high, le uh, you know, high Andes mountains, um, who can really give good advice, and that the farmers are going to trust. I mean, one of the one a good example of where we've really had to sort of take a big leap is um, in in Indonesia. We have developed a rainfall prediction app in which farmers are working with local universities to try to uh, predict the rainfalls and be able to then um, plant and and not lose their you know not lose their crops and to adjust to climate change well initially when we reached out to the farmers even though we were you know our staff are all local people the farmers were kind of like yeah right um you know I've been doing this and my family's been doing this for hundreds of years. Don't tell me when I should plant, you know. So it took some it took some work to uh, have the farmers trust the universities, the universities respect the farmers. And now after it's been we've been doing this for nine years um, and honing it over all that time, we're, we're getting to a point where we have a very, very effective a system in which the universities can actually map out. Uh, for the farmers, what they predict will be the rainfall uh, patterns. So these up. are local universities basically collaborating with local farmers with an exchange in which the university professors view the farmers as the experts in their field and are learning from the local farmers. So that's a matter of respect. It's listening. It's benefiting from that exchange. Um, right. Bridget, how... I'm, I'm sure this this is playing out right in coffee production in uh, in in these various environments. Is that is that correct? 
Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, 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 I listen with that with interest because I just remember one time, well, it's quite a few years ago when I wasn't actually working for Coffee Quality Institute, but um, we, we had a, a project, it was a women, it, supporting women, it was called Women in Coffee, it's, it was part of a, a bigger international movement of women in coffee, and we had this uh, component in the, in, the, um, in, in the project to teach women a little bit more about how to manage their household budgets and that a sort of finance sort of back little bit of teaching. And uh, we set this off and it built up this whole huge thing of non-trust because we didn't invite the men to it. So in the end, we had to invite couples to come to do it. But the minute we invited the men, it sort of took off. But in terms of CQI and, and what we do, we work with instructors to provide our um, education under license. And we're also trying to get many more geographically um, uh, positioned instructors in the countries where we're doing the work rather than sort of helicopter in an American instructor of which we have, have, have very good instructors and many. Um, so we're kind of also pivoting a little bit in that, that, uh, that, that way, but it takes quite a long time to, to train um, uh, these, the, these instructors. So we also look at, for instance, I, I can just quote an example at the moment. We're sending instructors from Brazil to Thailand. We're sending instructors from uh, Central South, South America to the Philippines. Um, we've just had instructors in, in India doing a, a post-harvest practicing course. So we're trying to kind of cross, cross pollinate uh, origin wise in that respect as well. But it's interesting again, that recently, you know, USAID is talking about localization and it's something that we also have to address because in the past we were part of huge multi-year, uh, multi-million dollar projects providing education over a period of four or five years. And now that's kind of changing because now it's the loca local uh, people that are, are dictating how and for the better these projects are, are built up. Um, so we ha we're having to, to adapt our program to be able because we still they still need the education, but there are still the local uh, instructors that can provide the same education because that's how we're set up anyway. Well, I'll bet that Maria has the same kind of story, right? Are you doing a lot of cross poll uh, pollination? So, for example, if you yeah. have manufacturing facilities in different countries. You're Absolutely. not flying people from the U.S. You're moving from one country in the global south to another global so where, where people are sharing. And then you also, those people on the ground are dealing with their cultural differences, right? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So the Plumpy Field Network was actually started by a French company, Nutriset. And so there's the French company and then there's Edicia in the U.S., Apart from that, all the other partners, the nine others are in local countries and there, there is a lot of regional cross-pollination. So initially, the initial technology transfer starts in France and that, that does help. But then after that is launched, so we have a West Africa region. So there's cross-pollination. The factory in Burkina Faso, when they were getting set up, they went to Niger, they got advice there. They had techs go back and forth. In Sudan and Ethiopia, those two factories, there's also a lot of back and forth um, support. They had a factory director who was from Sudan, went and ran the factory in Ethiopia for a couple of years to get them up and running. Um, and there are a lot, it is a lot easier to help with regional challenges. Um, now that's also happening with some of the extension work. So Sudan has been a leader um, with working with peanut farmers. They have, it's called Dar Foods and they work in they work with thousands of peanut farmers in Darfur, and it's mutually beneficial, right? It helps the farmers, they're getting supply chains, and then they have a guaranteed market because they want those high quality, low aflatoxin peanuts to be able to make plumpy nut in the factory in Khartoum. So that, that uh, extension work experience is also something they're able to share with other partners who are trying to do more extension work. Um, and certainly they've got a lot more experience than um, in a lot of those areas than we do in the US. I wonder whether this approach of using um, nonprofits, uh, local government actors, local community actors, international NGOs and so on, all coming together, that this approach actually is is better scaled to meet the local and regional needs and more adaptable than some government bureaucracy that is deployed on, an, on a nationwide uh, basis, because nations Borders are very often um, arbitrarily set, right? Whereas regions, agricultural regions, cross borders. So if you, if instead of looking at this as a national um, sort of problem that is determined by national bureaucracies, instead, if you have this conglomeration, you can 
flexibly adapt to the agricultural situations that that you're finding in these different countries. Are there any thoughts that you have on on how the future ought to evolve in this space so that you are more and more effective and you're not stepping on each other's toes as you're trying to serve your various constituents? Uh, Kate, adventure any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, World Neighbors, first of all, is a relatively small organization. So our goal is actually to get the government to come in and to take over a lot of the areas that we are are sort of jump starting. So you're a pump primer. You're you're jump starting. You're, right. You're and then and then is that transferring to government only, or is it for local nonprofits or it's everything? It's it's finding partners. We work with local partners, uh, local NGOs, or, or community based organizations. If they're not there, we'll help form them because our whole sustainability model is that we're going to get out of there and we're going to want them to be then monitoring and sustaining all of these, uh, you know, interventions that we've started. So we actually work very closely with governments. We want the government to come and see the work and then to uh, figure out how they can support it in the long term. Um, you know, we're dealing with communities that many times are very far from the grid. I mean, in Haiti, for example, you have the, the challenge that I can say, I can sit here and say, oh, we work with governments. Well, there isn't much of a government in Haiti right now. It's a conflict zone. Haiti is one massive conflict zone. Exactly. So there you have this challenge that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to completely give up on having uh, the government move towards these very remote areas. On the other hand, you have to make sure that they have their own ability to sustain uh, given the, the crisis that they're in right now. We asked a couple of questions. We said, what is the most critical food security challenge facing the global South today? And we, we posed uh, climate change, poor farming techniques, poor access to markets. The, the vast majority of people said all are critical. And then we also uh, asked about uh, food supplies and prices are especially vulnerable to climate change in sub-Saharan Africa and other places in the global south because, and again, you have kind of an all of the above kind of an answer, lack of resilience, food import dependence, excessive government intervention, and so on and so forth. So if we if we take a look at, at these kinds of, of issues and we see that there are so many um, complex elements here, how do we, uh, Maria, create a response that is adaptable as, as needs shift from region to region, as the climate changes so quickly, as water comes and goes? How do we create responses that increase resilience along across a broad, broad front? It's not just sitting there and educating people. Right. There is this combination of immediate help, as some of your products provide, and then sustained help by transforming the uh, production from a centralized sort of Western based production to a regional based production that also in the way it's it unfolds, that also increases uh, resilience against all of these different uh, effects. How do you do that? Yeah, I think. In, in this world, it's never either or, it's always both. Like you were asking previously about government versus not NGOs, you know, it's both. Kate, you were talking about that. Um, when we're talking about how do we have resilience, I really love the model of social enterprise, whether it's nonprofit or for profit. I think that we're all touching upon that of using business to do good. Um, so using developing these supply chains to do good because they ultimately can be more sustainable if people have access first, you know, to the inputs they need and then are empowered to create what small businesses, medium-sized businesses, social enterprise, you are creating value in the community and also people are benefiting from it directly. They're creating things that are needed in their country and they also are benefiting from it. It's That's interesting. Supply chains because... and it has a ripple effect. There's there's this big develop uh, there's this big discussion in business as to whether one should think about social impact of business mm -hmm. as part of business right there yeah. there's this real debate but yeah. but you're talking Kate about this not really being a debate business should be not only self sustaining 
mm-hmm. uh, and thriving, and they should, you know, profit making and so on and so forth, but also safeguard the customer, the consumer, the partners, and advance their interests. Bridget, how do you see this evolution of business? Are we talking about a model that is firmly on the side of sort of social impact, beneficial social impact of business in the way that, for example, the Hershey model in a, in U.S. history was an attempt to advance that kind of um, benefit uh, across a broader community. Uh, Bridget, you're on you're on uh, mute again. No, I think that uh, in in the coffee industry that there is a lot of pre-competitive work that's now going on with the roasters, that they are part of the solution, that they are that they're becoming part of the solution. And 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 social impact, yes, it's partly that, but it's really to secure the the the, the supply of coffee and good quality coffee and it's more in their of interest. It. Uh, it's in their interest. So, I mean, there are a lot of global uh, coffee organizations and and movements that are addressing these co- these together, these problems together, like the World Coffee Producers Forum. Uh, there's also the ICO, the International Coffee Organization that has a private sector panel. There's a global coffee platform. So there are a lot of um, places that we can go and meet and, and, and talk together. And, and, and that's where the whole value chain comes into play because it is in everybody's interest. So it's in, in working together, we have to sort of find the solutions. And climate change resilience and crop resilience, coffee resilience, you know, the research is ongoing to try and find more resilient plants so that we can continue to drink coffee for the next 50 years. Because at the moment, they, you know, with two, two degrees change in, in, in uh, climate, a lot of the, the producing countries will not exist anymore. You know, it's very interesting. What you're all saying is that we actually are looking at not a zero sum game. We are instead looking at an optimization challenge. How do we optimize the benefit across a broad uh, swath instead of being transactional where you lose if I win? And if I, if you win, I lose. Instead of doing that, we're talking about um, basically helping each other and respecting each other and listening to each other and learning from each other, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. Is 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 that the the power that you all have in terms of how you operate when you go and talk with with uh, donors and supporters? Is that is that a, a major part of your pitch, Kate? When you when you're out there talking to people? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm big on telling people your part of the global community, you know, our name says it all, we're all world neighbors. You're, you, I encourage young people when I speak at universities to become global citizens, engage in what's going on out there. It becomes very fulfilling. I talk about, you know, we're an, we're, we're not a faith-based organization, but there is a kind of a spiritual feeling when you go out and you see that people are doing better because of the work that we're doing with them. Uh, it's, it's a great feeling. So yeah, I would, I would definitely, say that your your term optimization is great. It encapsulates uh, what we've all been talking about in the last half hour. Well, it's just it's just great to discuss this with you. I'll leave you with this thought. We, we asked a question, who do you believe is responsible to fix the agriculture and food security challenges in the global south? We got three answers. The three answers all had even numbers of, of responses, governments, and then people in the global south, and people in the G20. So if you look at governments, they're going to be people in the in the G20 and people in the global south. So it really comes down to that, that partnership. I'd like to thank you, Kate Chester, uh, President and CEO of World Neighbors, Bridget Carrington, Interim CEO of the Coffee Quality Institute, and Maria Kasparian, uh, Executive Director of Edicia Nutrition. You are just so wonderful. Please thank your staffs, your board members, your donors, your communities, your partners, and please thank the people on the ground for uh, from us. It is just wonderful to have uh, uh, people who are working toward a common solution in a way that advances respect, advances resilience, and helps us all uh, actually uh, have access to these Uh, wonderful, wonderful products that you're producing and distributing. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you.